In 1975, Sam Shepard was hired as a writer to work on a proposed film of Bob Dylan's secret Rolling Thunder review tour of the northeast of America. Nathan Osgood reads the final part of his book recording that tour. Rolling Thunder Logbook by Sam Shepard. This book has taken on such a fractured form, not for the sake of art or experimentation, but rather because the form is a direct outcome of a fractured memory. The purpose of the book isn't to reveal a plotting blow-by-blow account of the sequence of events or to play people using their village as a potential location where, but all I'm ready for right now is a hot bath and a bed. We finally locate their houses on a stretch of lonely road, big beautiful white clapboard masterpieces of early American architecture, glistening in white light in the nighttime snow. The Shakers are patiently waiting for us on the front porch. One woman and two men, all slightly over middle age or thereabouts, dressed in very plain clothes, but nothing resembling a uniform or religious vestment. Between the three of us, we've managed to disappear about eight J's, each the size of a Tipperillo cigar, and our exit from the car must seem a little obvious to the Shaker folks. We manage to forage our way through the bright snow banks and come to rest on their porch. They're very cordial people and not at all irritated by our late arrival. They welcome us inside to a warm hallway of tongue-and-groove maple paneling, a staircase with a hand-rubbed cherry wood handrail. Everything is totally neat and scrubbed to the bone. Not a trace of dust anywhere in every single article in its place. We stand there shuffling the snow off our shoulders like three renegade fur trappers while they take us all in. The odd thing is that I feel absolutely no judgment coming from them. They aren't comparing their way of life to ours. They seem not to care about the way we look or the fact that we're obviously zipped out of our minds. We follow the oldest shaker down the hallway and into an immense kitchen with long tables, original handmade chairs, and rows of copper kettles hanging from brass hooks. Mel is trying to carry on some semblance of sober rationality with the man, while at the same time looking like something out of a Charles Dickens nightmare. Well, what we'd really like to do if this meets with your approval, is to have Joan and Bob come down with just a few of the others and just sort of look the place over, just to see if it fits into Bob's idea of the film. The Shaker senior is nodding and smiling and rocking back on his heels as though inwardly he's laughing his ass off. That's fine with us. We'd be glad to have them. I suddenly see this whole thing as a museum, not just a museum of objects, but of an entire way of life that these people are embalming in the flesh. They've all retired from the life out there in the big, mean, nasty world in preference for preserving an idealized morality of the past. Everywhere there seems to be a great starvation for tradition and true culture in this country, and these people seem to have answered that need for themselves by cutting themselves off completely. Rolling Thunder is starving for something, too, but at the opposite end of the stick, by throwing themselves in completely, by sniffing through the past for pieces of evidence that could lead us to a truer picture of the present. How did we arrive where we are now? What series of events actually went down to cause us to be at this point in time? Where exactly are we? On the road to our dinner in a plastic hotel. Thanksgiving. Homesickness is hitting me strong. Even though Barry Imhoff has done everything a producer could to turn this snowbound holiday in into a family atmosphere. Great long tables arranged in a horseshoe, complete with white tablecloths and all the holiday trimmings. Dylan's kids kicking dozens of colored balloons past the waitress's heads as they weave toward the tables, balancing steaming golden turkeys and platters of cranberry sauce. It's not exactly life on the farm, but it fills the gaps left by six weeks of room service and take-out hamburgers. 
Halfway through the main course, a pitching contest breaks out between the opposing tables. Using cashew nuts, turkey legs, small white after-dinner mints, and an assortment of side orders. Lou is really getting into it and perfecting his high arcing lobs with creamed onions using a spoon for a catapult. The kids have really taken over now, diving under the tables and bombing each other with turkey carcasses. Dylan sits in an overcoat and hat, picking over the remains of his giblets. He rarely looks up from his plate as though anything worth seeing could be just as well heard and felt through the atmosphere. There's a sudden crash from one end of the room and a loud gurgling roar coming from Dave Myers, who's pushed over an entire table, glasses, silverware, plates, the whole shot. He begins pounding both fists on the fallen table, bellowing, food, food, over and over. Evidently, he didn't find any in the kitchen. This is turning into a far cry from what the pilgrims had in mind. Dylan looks up slowly, eyes toward the chaos, then goes back to his giblets. The waitresses are hauling in cakes, pies, puddings, and stuff like that. Dylan's mother is helping herself to seconds and seems to be enjoying life on the road. The night of the hurricane, December 9, Madison Square Garden. The garden is sold out for the concert within five hours after the box office opens. It is billed as a benefit for Reuben Carter, and it's for sure that the public interest generated by the presence of Muhammad Ali and Dylan in the same space is going to leak down to that New Jersey jailhouse and work its own kind of leverage on the law. Already the papers are talking about reprieves and retrials, and there's no doubt that this event will add some muscle to the whole cause. This must be the American way, all right. Nothing's important or has any value until it's blown up into bigger-than-life proportions. Get the biggest damn fucking hole in the whole entire planet. Get the heavyweight champ of the whole entire world. Get the greatest folk singer since Edith Piaf, the most incredible poet-musician phenomenon the world has ever seen, and throw them all together in front of the biggest goddamn flesh-and-blood toe-tapping audience this side of the Rio Grande. And we'll have ourselves a show, folks. I'm game. The band kicks off into Good Love is Hard to Find, and the volcano erupts. Rolling thunder meets itself head on in the voice of over 3,500 screaming beings from Earth. Dylan may be just a kid from Minnesota, but this here is his hometown. The set rolls on, and then Muhammad Ali is introduced. This is becoming like a study in emotional trauma. It's hard to believe how the space can contain any more hysteria than it's already had, but Ali is like nitroglycerin wherever he appears, and tonight is no exception. You know, when they asked me to come here tonight, I was wondering who this guy Bob Dylan was. Then I show up and see that all these people come to pay money, and I think this Bob Dylan must be something. I thought I was the only one who could pack this joint out. Did all you girls really come here tonight to see Bob Dylan? Huge cheer explodes from the house. All right, all right. He ain't as putty as me, though, you have to admit. Now, I just want to say that it's a pleasure to see such a turnout here tonight, especially when it's for the cause of helping a black man in jail. Because everybody knows that you got to have the complexion and the connections to get the protection. Now, here comes the real theatrics. One of Ali's aides walks out onto the stage carrying a telephone. Someone interrupts him at the microphone and whispers in his ear, the whole thing's been planned long in advance, but it's being put across like it's just now happening. Ali pulls back from the man and grabs the microphone. I've just been told that we have a special phone call right here that's been put through all the way from New Jersey by a special order from the governor. We got Mr. Reuben Hurricane Carter on the phone, and you're going to be able to hear this voice as he's speaking to me. Allie picks up the phone and Carter's voice can be heard as though it's coming through thousands of miles of submerged cable. The solitary voice keeps sailing into every corner of the place like a phantom. The imagination is working double time, conjuring up images of this man, locked up and speaking over a phone somewhere to an audience he can't even see. By this time, everybody's champing at the bit for Dylan. As usual, he just appears. 
Nobody announces him. He simply sidles out there with his head slightly down, plume shaking, white face thicker than usual, and starts singing. He's always got the jump on the audience that way. He knows he's out there way before they do, and it gives him the edge every time. Now the place is storming again, along with all the Mexican trimmings. Dylan is moving in slow motion through a coagulated mass of parasites, pulling on his coat like he was Lindbergh just returning. His gray caballero cowboy hat with the dancing plumes is the only thing visible of him. Once in a while, a rare snatch of red coat with pink hands clawing it. Movie stars are here, spitting up beer in the aisles in fits of hysterical glee. The place is on fire with unchained energy. Somehow, we escape and dive into his camper in a garage situation, an underground garage. Dylan's definitely an escape artist. I've never seen the like of it. He vanishes, just like that. Now, he's at the wheel of this thing, which on the inside, if you didn't see the driver and the steering wheel, could pass for a California ash ram. It's dark in this garage, but you can still make out the wide-brimmed hat at the wheel. Several other heads are crowding up the floor space, all silent. I'm taking a leak in the portable bathroom and hanging halfway out in order to see where we're going, as though that could verify the situation somehow. The back is full of fancy women sitting on a thick bed, rolling black joints. I can't believe he's actually driving this contraption after just completing a full four hours of rip-snorting musical magic. The garden was definitely the culmination of something for Rolling Thunder. Now we're hitting the streets and he's starting to crank this monster up to around 50, which is really hauling ass for an apartment on wheels. Blue clouds of reefer smoke are blinding the windows, but you can still catch the outside light. I'm losing track of time and space, but it seems we're heading midtown through some miracle of navigation. He breaks the sucker and bails out in the middle of the road. Now here's the situation. Every one of us inside this hulk of a machine is just along for the ride. Dylan's gone again, and it's only us. That was the final part of Sam Shepard's book, The Rolling Thunder Logbook. It was abridged in five parts by Peter Everett, read by Nathan Osgood, and produced in Bristol by Mark Yobst.